So uh, first, I will have to ask who's close. Would you get my glasses? I've got my reading glasses on, so everybody's a blur. Makes it kind of hard to connect with the audience if everything is a blur. So, very interesting uh, situation. Thank you. We're buying, if you don't know, we're buying a, a building which is next to us. And it's a, a pretty good price, pretty reasonable price, about, depending on how you want to figure it, about a third to the fourth of its actual worth. And um, so I, I uh, very often find out how unskilled I am in <laughs> dealing with this sort of thing. So the first thing that happened is that I, I called my uh, friend who organizes fundraisers. We've only ever had one fun fundraiser in our entire history. And so I called her and I said, Michelle, we need a fundraiser because we're gonna, we have a chance to buy the house next to us, two and a half acres. Very, very reasonable price, but we're going to have to do some major work on it get it up where we want it, it'll be wonderful for us. And she said, okay, let me check. And she got back a couple hours later and said, oh, it's a really bad time. Everybody's trying to build temples, $15 million temples. There is no money in Orange County. Uh, I said, oh, okay. So I thought, well, all right. So we just, we just move slowly along, seeing what the Buddha's gonna say about this. And she said to me, she said, well, you need to talk to your people. <laughs> already did that. So, yeah, we actually had money in the donation box last Sunday. And, uh, and she said, and I will tell people, you know, in San Diego and whatnot, that uh, what's going on. So I get a phone call. Now, when I got the phone call, I thought, you know, if you just relax and... Uh, Take a breath, the Buddha will provide. And I have to think about that uh, Israeli Zen master with the big nose named Jesus, you know. He said, look at the birds. They don't worry about anything. Look at the lilies in the field. They don't worry about anything. So I thought, okay, everything's going to be fine one way or another. And then I get a phone call. And uh, the phone call said, oh, we want to come visit you. And uh, so we went back and forth because the lady wanted to come on Friday, but the man couldn't come on Friday. You know how those goes. And so we went back and forth. When can we come? And I said, well, when, when do you want to come? And they ended up coming yesterday. And he had told me about the lady. He said, oh, this lady owns so-and-so restaurant in Orange County, and she owns many restaurants. And I'm thinking, Oh, the Buddha has answered my prayers. We have someone that's going to help us buy this property. And this will be wonderful. And it isn't just buying the property. It's the new revised estimate is probably $15,000 in uh, repairs. All new plumbing pipes, new carpet, all of that stuff. And so I thought, oh, well, any help we get is going to be wonderful and they're going to come visit. So they came visit, and you see our new orchids, and uh, and then we have uh, lots of wonderful fruit. They bought lugs and lugs of fruit, and uh, and there we were, and they visited for a couple hours, and, uh, and uh, no, nothing was said about helping pay for the property. So, you know, the Buddha puts out all these situations for us to deal with. If you're more comfortable with saying life does, that's fine too. I always think of the Buddha. I think of the Buddha laughing and going, see, you got all excited and uh, there was no reason to get excited. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then they left. And uh, I haven't been feeling very good for the last week. 
it's finally been decided that I was either overworked or I was sick. One or the other doesn't really matter because now I feel better. And I thought about it after they left and I got my nap. It was kind of late and I got up and I thought, well, see, that's what happens when you start falling back into the notion of desire and being driven by desire. And I told the lady, when, and I told the group before they left, because it was very obvious, you know, they said, well, what are you going to do with that? Why do you want that? And I said, well, I got a couple of monks, and it has two bedrooms in it, and it'll be great. They could stay there. And I've told these monks about it. I said, well, we have central heating in the winter and a new cooler on the roof. Boy, it'd be great. And I'm trying to cajole them into moving in here so I have a labor force. And then I thought in a big, big room, much bigger than our Sangha hall, big, big room, and another kitchen, you know. And somebody had said, well, you know, maybe when we do the big, the big uh, ceremonies and everything, they could cook in that kitchen. It would be more uh, easier. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm getting all excited, getting all excited. And then, and I told them, I said, what are you going to do with it? I said, well, you know, we have retreats. There's lots of the living room with a new carpet, lots of places for people to put down sleeping bags. So I got myself all pumped up. And then nothing was said. And so they looked at me and I said, and of course I can just go back to work and solve the problem that way. And, uh, you know, because there looks like there may be a job made, but who knows? And once again, I don't want to get too attached to the idea at the college there may be a job opening up there and I could go back to work, you know, until I get old. And so, you know, but I got tangled up in this thing of, of thinking, oh, this is going to happen, which then means I can become disappointed. And I was disappointed for, I don't know, 20 minutes, you know. Uh, so here's the thing. You, you can uh, hide from life and everything will be fine, you know, and uh, you don't ever have to worry about anything. You can stay, I think about these people, you know, you can stay in your house or your apartment or your little tiny world and everything will be fine. Or you can actually step into the world and everything won't be fine unless you let it be fine. You know, Dogen was a wonderful teacher and uh, on the sunny days when this, you know, in Japan, he would say, what a beautiful day, the best of all days. And when it rained, he would say, what a beautiful day, the best of all days. And when it snowed, what a gorgeous day. And it is. It is what we have, you know. I had to do a little reassessment of my expectations, which usually aren't very big. You know, one of my expectations is that anything I attempt to do takes me three or four times longer. And I'm usually totally satisfied with the result because it takes three or four times longer. And I thought, there's no hurry. You know, I can have people sleep on that living room floor and on the old carpet that's 30 years old, it's nasty and smells, and I'll just light some incense in there. And, you know, if the water doesn't work, well, we can always take buckets of water over there, right? I mean, he was in Japan, you know, just take buckets of water. So what am I what am I worrying about here? Um, and so it ta it takes a while, you know. In another sense, we're in very good shape because we know we have Buddha's Enlightenment Day coming up in December, which for those watching this on YouTube or wherever they watch it is going to be December 18th. The first time I put an advertisement out. Now we've dated ourselves, December 18th, 2016. So imagine now, five years from now, somebody's watching this going, oh darn, I missed it. <laughs> and so people will come, we'll have a nice crowd here, they'll make donations, it'll go in my coffee can, and when there's enough money, we'll get a new carpet for the place. And then New Year's, they always visit us with the busloads. And one year, I said to Vui Mung, this is maybe three years ago, I said, Boy, I hope they make enough donations so we can buy a new storage shed because we don't have any room at all in the old storage shed. 
Not only did we get a new storage shed, but we got a roll-up door on the storage shed, which is really nice. So, really, time will just take care of it. I have a good friend that I had lunch with last week, and his philosophy is that, and he was just got out of the hospital, his philosophy is that, well, our, uh, I can't think of the word, I want to say ancestors, but it's not ancestors. It's those that come after us. They can finish the job. So I think about that, and then I, you know, I start, oh, everything's okay. Because if I don't get that done, I get him, him, him. Why am I worried? Yeah, him, him, yeah. So I don't have to worry about anything. You guys can finish it. Yeah. Uh, but it is very much a perspective thing. You know, there, there is a story, which I've told many, many, many times. And, and there's this, something that I've said many, many times when people come to the interview room. I tell them they have to let go. And it's said so often, I think, I think you know, we just went through, I think it's over with, a big rash of these self-help self books. You know, everybody's making a, a lot of money <clears throat> for telling other people how to be happy in their life. We know the author's happy because they got lots of money. <laughs> I read a little cartoon yesterday that said, Given a choice between being miserable and wealthy and, and miserable and poor, I'll be miserable and wealthy. And I thought, okay, all right. Yeah, I get that one. Uh, but there, there's a very famous story about uh, a couple monks. And it's funny, I read the Japanese version of it yesterday. And it's, it's older than Japan. It's actually started in China. In Japan, they're going down a muddy road. In China, they're going to cross a stream. And, and the two monks are walking along. They're doing their traveling from one village to another. And there's a pretty girl standing next to the stream. And she has a gorgeous dress on. And they say, can we help you? And she says, I'm afraid to go into the stream. I don't know how deep it is. I'm I don't want to ruin my dress. And so one of the monks is a big guy like me. And he goes, no problem. And he picks her up and carries her across the stream and then puts her back down. And the two monks, they go, they go along for a while and the other monk, he keeps looking at the monk that carried the girl and keeps looking at the monk that carries the girl. And finally they get back to their temple and he says, okay, I can't take it anymore. Monks aren't supposed to touch girls. And the big monk said, that's right. He says, but you touched her. He said, yep, I did. He says, you carried her across the stream. And he said, yeah, I did. And then I put her down. But you've been carrying her all the way to this temple. So when we mess up, you know, are we going to carry it forever? I messed up yesterday. I have to make a confession. I knew I shouldn't say anything about the fact that I started paying for this property because <laughs> it's not good psychology. And I, and I let that slip. Oh, you've already bought it. Well, no, I, I, I bought a payment every month out of my retirement check. That's what I bought. <laughs> but the psychology is not good because I don't have a lot of guile. So I need somebody like Francisco. See, I should keep my mouth shut. Get somebody crafty like Francisco. He would know how to sell this thing. And that's usually what they do in temples, you know. They get somebody that has a silver tongue <laughs> to handle everything. So that's my confession about what happened of letting go, just simply letting go. I'm looking at the clock, and the clock says this was a really short confession. <laughs> So I wanted to comment on something in the, in the chant that we did. And uh, every couple of years I, I remark on this so people don't get confused. The chant we did for the renewing of the precepts was a, a long poem, long awkward poem written by a Vietnamese monk. It was never intended to be used for renewing the precepts. 
And oh, every couple of months I think to myself, well, I ought to make a shorter version of the traditional ceremony and then let you taste that. And then I, my normal lazy nature comes through and I take a nap after lunch and that doesn't happen. But it's still there. The traditional ceremony takes uh, a while because, uh, you know, there's 108 bows that are done in it. Well, we wouldn't do that. But uh, I, I think, I think uh, this monk back here would love it. And I, the more I think about it, I think, because we're doing the Lotus Sutra now uh, as uh, a class and have been doing it. Started off as monk's class and then other people join in. And he's kind of bewildered by all the names, the long names the Buddha has. And the traditional ceremony, you recite the 88 names of the Buddha. <laughs> so I'm thinking maybe, maybe we ought to be doing that ceremony just for you. <laughs> yeah. But I, he, he has a little problem with names that are longer than, say, Bob. <laughs> yeah, he goes, why are they so long? And uh, so this, this poem was written, and I helped a, a, a monk who was trying to translate it into English. Of course, he became very scandalized when I wrote him and told him that we were using it for the renewing the precept ceremony rather than the traditional thing. Oh, no, no, that wasn't the purpose of it. Because, you know, Buddhism in some areas is just like the Catholic Church. It only takes a thousand years to change, you know. And so, yeah, he wasn't real excited about that. But one of the things in there, there's two or three things in here. We have a monk who's written, who's, who's, who's written this poem. And um, he has a very good heart. He's very familiar with the Lotus Sutra. Those of you studying the Lotus Sutra, you see all the references in the Lotus Sutra? We're about halfway through it. Did you see them? Yeah, yeah they're all through that. And But one of the things that he says in there that could be misleading is, I pray that I will realize my Buddha nature. I will go back to my Buddha nature. Not realize, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Go back to my Buddha nature. That's what he said. So I will ask you, how do you get away from your Buddha nature? How do you how do you accomplish that? Can you do a terrible, terrible thing? The newspapers are filled. I'm getting the newspaper again, and I think it was a big mistake. <laughs> you know, I either get to look at Donald and Hillary, or I get to read about the latest thing where somebody shot a bunch of people. You know, I look at the Sunday paper this morning. And uh, a 13 year old and a little bitty girl were shot. And I didn't even want to read the article. It was in another state. Of course, that's our biggest problem. We get to hear about everybody that's done these horrible things all over the world. And we go, oh, that must be Compton. No, no, that was Afghanistan. You know, these terrible things. And that was Russia. So, do they not have Buddha nature? These people that do terrible things? Is this Buddha nature something you acquire? Well, then the poem, see, I'm, someday I'm going to change this poem. I originally made it to where it didn't sound like it was translated by a dictionary. And that was good. But I didn't want to go in there and be too editorial. But uh, there's no way you can escape your Buddha nature. Can you escape your human nature? No. No, you can't escape your human nature. You're stuck. Okay, so how do you escape your Buddha nature? How do you lose it? So, as Dogen said, why, why do we have to practice? Dogen was a Tendai monk that studied the Lotus Sutra. And he couldn't figure out, why do we have to practice? Why do we have to read this sutra? Why do we have to do ceremonies? Why do we have to do any of this stuff? Why aren't we spontaneously, why don't we know that we're Buddha? <clears throat> Who has access to a child that's two or three years old? Anyone? No access? 
Okay. All right, you know where St. Mary's Hospital is? Okay, you can go to St. Mary's Hospital, I think any hospital, but I know where this is at St. Mary's. You can go up to neonatal. You can look through the big window where the new babies are. You want to see Buddha? There they are. They never forgot. They haven't been around long enough to get confused. Every one of those babies is expressing their Buddha nature. So what happened with us? We got confused. Francisco's dad said, you must be a success in life. You must make a lot of money. I'll teach you how to do it. You've got to do this. You've got to be driven. You have no sense of accomplishment unless you achieve great things. Right, Francisco? Kind of, sort of. No, maybe. He was the other way around, I guess. That's was he the other way around? Yeah. So you reacted the other way? Yes. Okay. Well, it works both ways. I'll show you. <laughs> you have the I show you psychology. Yes. But what you don't know is that your father was very smart. He understood human psychology. He knew if he told you you had to do that, you wouldn't. So he told you not to do that. They call that reverse psychology, right? Right, right. But we have all these things we're told. Vui Mung, his dad, he's told me some of the things his dad wanted him to practice. He rebelled. He resisted. Okay? So now he's in a rope. Because I think when he resisted, he started walking his own path. But that doesn't mean he wasn't influenced by everything that happens. Everyone is influenced by things that happen to them. I came to a conclusion about three or four years ago that nobody ever had a perfect childhood. Okay, we all, we all know that there's television families. When I was a kid, there was Donna Reed, Fathers Knows Best, all those shows that people talk about that nobody's ever seen. I used to watch them. My Three Sons. Everybody, my three sons, I love my three sons because they all had styled hair, including the cook. They all went to a hairstylist back when men started doing that. Okay, And the, the, the hardest decision they had to make was which girl to take to the dance. Nothing was more complicated than that. And yet, as I go along, every time I meet somebody, I find that everybody has had a challenge. Everybody has had something they had to overcome. Many people were hungry when they were young. Many people experienced one kind of violence or another. I call this the human condition. There's a reason why the Catholic Church invented saints. There's reasons why Buddhism invented bodhisattvas. Because every once in a while somebody comes along that is not driven by their demons and they learn how to put them down. And then they start helping other people. And the moment you start helping other people, your demons are dispersed. And that's the only magic in Buddhism, is you can get rid of the nightmare by helping someone else. Or you can live the nightmare your entire life. You know, we have a whole group of people coming home with nightmares. You know, the military says, well, maybe some of them have PTSD. Did I say that right? Yeah. No. All of them. You've heard me say this. Maybe somebody watching on YouTube will get the message. Everybody coming home has suffered and will have nightmares. So how are you going to take care of them? And don't think you're going to talk to them. But you could listen. Listening is good. You could simply hold them. That's what Mother Teresa did. Okay, She never preached to anyone. So this is when you disappear and your Buddha nature, which never left, manifests itself, appears before the world. <clears throat>